ipmnation.com. President Donald Trump is once again threatening to cut aid to three Central American countries for not stopping a migrant caravan that's making its way across Mexico toward the U.S. In a tweet Monday, he said Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador failed to stop the migrants. So now he said the U.S. is going to start cutting off or substantially reducing the massive foreign aid routinely given to them. The president also said he's alerted Border Patrol and the military that the situation is a, quote, national emergency. Trump previously threatened to close the U.S.-Mexico border over the caravan. On Sunday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo accused migrants in the caravan of provoking violence. He also said organizers were politically motivated and said the U.S. wouldn't let the migrants into the country. The caravan started its march on October 12th with about 160 people. As of Sunday night, Mexican officials said that the migrant caravan had expanded to some 7,000 people. It's unclear where the additional people came from. On Saturday, Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales said thousands of migrants in the caravan had returned to Honduras after being held up while trying to cross the Mexico-Guatemala border. Much of the caravan reportedly avoided authorities by illegally crossing the Suchiate River into Mexico. Mexico has asked for help from the UN Refugee Agency to help figure out which migrants have legitimate asylum claims. Individuals will need to apply for refugee status if they don't have the right travel document. And I was at the immigration scene, shining and feeling clean. Could it be a sin? I got stopped by the immigration man, said he doesn't know. With his immigration face Giving me a paper chase But the sun was coming Cause all it was It looked into my space Stamped a number over my face And it sent me running Won't you let me in Immigration man Can I cross the line and pray I can stay another day Immigration form is big enough to keep me warm when the cold winds come in. So go where you will, as long as you think you can. You better watch out, watch out for the man. Anywhere you're going, come on and let me in. Immigration man, can I cross the line and pray? Take your fingers from the train. Since this is the last speech that I will give as president, I think it's fitting to leave one final thought, an observation about a country which I love. It was stated best in a letter I received not long ago. A man wrote me and said, you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth, 
can come to live in America and become an American. from downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. Also uh, streaming on Facebook via Facebook Live on the Matt Connerton Unleashed Facebook page. Uh, the, uh, the, the audio stream that goes to the website is down, but you can, uh, you can still watch on Facebook and hear everything and catch every scintillating second of audio here uh, on the program. So welcome. It is Monday, October 22nd, the year of our Lord, 2018. My name is Matt Connerton, and uh, so nice to have you with me. 603-250-6007 is the uh, number to call, 603-250-6007. And of course, you can also uh, opine on anything you like in the Facebook Live chat. Though I'd love it if you called. I would love to hear your dulcet tones at 603 603- Two five zero six zero zero seven. Um, and by actually speaking of that specifically too, I would love to know if anyone can tell me uh, who's listening to the program live uh, right now, as it happens in real time at four oh eight p.m. on this day, um, what is going on <laughs> in the city? If you're in if you're in Manchester and you know what's up, let me know, please, um, because uh, on my way here. I saw, I was counting them. I saw a grand total of eight uh, police uh, cruisers, Manchester police cruisers. Um, and I heard the sirens of presumably even more than that. Plus, I heard a siren that um, sounded like a fire truck. So uh, I, I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, it's big. So if anyone can tell me, uh, because I am alarmed, and uh, no pun intended, I, I, I am quite alarmed. Uh, by whatever it is that might be going on out there. So uh, let me know, 603-250-6007, if you're listening live and you're in Manchester. Uh, I went to WMUR.com. I thought Channel 9 might have something, but uh, I couldn't find anything on the site. So I don't know. And I didn't have time to dig too deeply because I had to prepare for the show. But uh, let me know. Let me know what's happening. I just want to make sure that it's nothing uh, terrible, like a building hasn't exploded or something. My goodness. Um, also, too, uh, just quickly, uh, Carol Robido of Manchester Inc. Link, where all things Manchester connect, uh, sent me this. I just want to mention this quickly. Uh, on October 27th, there is a candidate meet and greet at Jupiter Hall, uh, hosted by Jupiter Hall and Manchester Inc. Link. Uh, so that's going to be uh, on Saturday, October 27th, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., uh, and that is at the, uh, uh, the office is at, uh, oh wait, where is Jupiter Hall? See, there's a, there's an address in here, but I think that's for Manchester Inc. Link, and this is actually at Jupiter Hall. So where is Jupiter Hall? I'm clicking the link to that because I don't even know exactly where that is. Um, Jupiter Hall is, da, 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 da. Uh, I don't know. I can't figure it out right now. Never mind. Just, uh, just go to it. Just, just f- figure out where it is and go. <laughs> I'm sure it's easy to find. But anyway, yes, it's, it's, uh, uh, cause the address, uh, that's here on the, uh, I think that's the address for, uh, Carol's office at Manchester Inkling. So I'm not going to give out that office. Well, unless you'd like to go visit Carol. But anyway, yeah, so that's this weekend, a candidate meet and greet at Jupiter Hall. Uh, so check that out. Very important to uh, stay engaged uh, civically and so forth. Um, as always, there is much to discuss. Uh, the weekends are just full 
of news and information, all these uh, ongoing developing stories. Oh, by the way, speaking of events, uh, thank you to everybody who uh, came to uh, Norm's event on Saturday at the Unitarian Church. You know, I love the UUs, the Unitarian Universalists, because everyone wins with the UUs. I mean, theologically, some people have some issues with that, but uh, it is a nice idea. Uh, all all inclusive, but uh, no, but it was a very nice event to raise uh, uh, money for Healing Paws, and uh, it was uh, great to see everybody who came down, who showed up um, at the Unitarian Universalist Church over on uh, Union Street, and I'm not sure when the, uh... wow, that's actually three U's, the Universalist Unitarians on Union Street. It's a triple U. Didn't occur to me until just now. How exciting. So, uh, oh, hello to Jackie Brown, who joins us in the uh, Facebook live chat. Welcome to the show. Um, So as I'm coming on uh, the air today, there's all this additional news about uh, Khashoggi and his killing in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. And, um, you know, I I talked about this quite a bit and Trump's handling of it thus far on Friday's show. And and I did receive some uh, Dr. Jeff Cassell reached out to me and I. I heard some com- uh, comments on it from uh, a few other people at the event on, on Saturday, actually. So I got a lot of positive feedback on it. So I'm glad that uh, so many of you enjoy my rantings and ravings. Um, but uh, th- this is getting, you know, obviously, I mean, the official story now out of the Saudis is, well, it was a fist fight that went wrong. Um, and I can tell you. You know, back from my days when, uh, you know, I would be in bands and I've, I've done a lot of concert promotion, promoted other bands and put on shows and whatnot. And uh, very often, you know, out in these bars, out in these clubs, you know, you got a show going on and a fight breaks out. And next thing you know, someone's uh, being dismembered. It's uh, it happens all the time. Uh, so a uh, perfectly reasonable explanation. Oh, sure, it was a, a fist fight that uh, no one meant to kill him. Just, you know, the fists were flying. We thought it was like a Three Stooges routine and no one's actually getting hurt. And oops, now he's dead. What can you do, right? So uh, I assume, I mean, I hope no one actually believes that, right? The, the official Saudi explanation. Trump seemed to believe it initially, but now he is, uh, now he seems to be uh, hedging his bets. <laughs> But then this popped up. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of Skype. Uh, I find it very glitchy. Um, In fact, the last time someone was going to join me here on the program via Skype, I said, uh, how about we do Facebook Live instead? It's much more stable. But apparently you can do things with Skype that I didn't know about. Uh, Reuters is reporting this, how the man behind Khashoggi murder ran the killing via Skype. I didn't know that that was uh, uh, one of the practical applications of that particular application. My goodness, you can run a murder via Skype. I I might have to revisit it. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, But it says here, again, this is from Reuters. He ran social media for Saudi Arabia's crown prince. He masterminded the arrest of hundreds of his country's elite. He detained a Lebanese prime minister. And according to two intelligence sources, he ran journalist Kamal, uh, I'm sorry, Jamal Khashoggi's brutal killing at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul uh, by giving orders via Skype. Saad al Qatani, a top aide for Saudi crown prince uh, MBS. We just call him, everybody in the media now just calls him MBS. It's easier is one of the fall guys as Riyadh tries to stem international outrage at Khashoggi's death. On Saturday, Saudi state media said uh, King Salman had sacked Katani and four other officials over the killing carried out by a 15-man hit team. By the way, again, I mean, whenever you have uh, a 15-man hit team involved in something and a fist fight breaks out, someone's going to end up dead and dismembered. Let, let, let's be honest. I mean, I used to say that all the time. You know, like I said, when I'd be out in the clubs promoting these uh, shows I'd be putting on, I would, uh, you know, I, I would sometimes I would talk to the bouncers and I would say, listen, I, I know you're just doing your job when you're tossing out people who are— uh, a little uh, overly inebriated and they're getting a little, uh, you know, they're causing a ruckus and whatnot. But I hope that we don't accidentally dismember anyone, if you don't mind. I don't need that kind of publicity. Let's see, it says here, um, uh, Katani's influence in the Crown Prince's entourage 
uh, has been so vast over the past three years, his own rise tracking that of his boss, that it will be hard for Saudi officials to paint Katani as the mastermind of the murder without also raising questions about the involvement of Prince Mohammed, according to several sources with links to the royal court. One source with ties to the royal court said, quote, This episode won't topple MBS. But it has hit his image, which will take a long time to be repaired if it ever does. The king is protecting him, unquote. Katani himself once said he would never do anything without his boss's approval. Oh, well, that's a bit incriminating for MBS, isn't it? And maybe he just meant until now. Uh, Katani tweeted last summer, quote, Do you think I make decisions without guidance? I am an employee and a faithful Executor of the orders of my lord, the king, and my lord, the faithful crown prince. Katani did not respond to questions from Reuters. His biography on Twitter changed in recent days from royal advisor to chairman of the Saudi Federation for Cybersecurity Programming and Drones, a role he had held before. Prince Mohammed has no knowledge of the operation that led to Khashoggi's death and, quote, certainly did not order a kidnapping or murder of anybody, unquote, a Saudi official said on Saturday. Officials in Riyadh could not be reached for further comment. As the crisis has grown over the past three weeks, Saudi Arabia has changed its tune on Khashoggi's fate, first denying his death, then saying he died during a brawl at the consulate and now attributing the death to a chokehold. No, oh, a chokehold during the brawl, maybe? Uh, Heidi Hammer says, uh, good afternoon, Matt. Where's the bathroom key? Where is the bathroom key indeed, Heidi Hamer? Mm. And Derek Evan Relford in the chat room says, hey, Matt, wondering if you would play my new song about mental illness, no curse words, and you can even turn it, turn it off if it sucks. Totally understand if your format doesn't warrant this. Derek, I would love to play that. Um, if you can... Um, send it to ipmnation at gmail.com. I'll even type it into the chat room here. Uh, as long as there's no curse words in it, I would love to play it. ipmnation at gmail.com. There you go. I put it in the Facebook live chat, too. Um, yeah, go ahead and send it to me, and uh, I'll uh, download it and play it during the show. I, I think it's... um. I think it's great that you're doing that, actually. I know you've, um, I think Ricky had talked about this, too, when he had called into the show, Ricky Litwinkowicz. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, since I don't have it in front of me, but, you know, discussing mental illness and, and really, you know, as someone who struggles with depression myself, I I, uh, I appreciate that uh, very much. So, yeah, go ahead and send that to me, um, and we will play it, perhaps at the top of the hour. I just got to keep an eye on my email, which I certainly don't mind doing. Um, yeah, so the story keeps changing. It, it keeps evolving, uh, the, the narrative, if you will, of exactly what happened here. Uh, a senior Saudi official told Reuters that the killers had tried to cover up what happened, contending that the truth was only now emerging. The Turks reject that version of the story, saying they have audio recordings of what happened. Now, remember that. That's, that's uh, an important piece of this puzzle. The Turks claim that they have audio of Khashoggi being murdered and killed, but they have not yet turned it over to the United States, according to the president. Trump was asked about it the other day. He said, no, we haven't heard it. They haven't given it to us yet, uh, if it exists. He kept kept saying that, too, if it exists. Uh, The kingdom has survived other crises in the past year, including the fallout of the Crown Prince's short-lived kidnapping of Lebanese Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri, In 2017, Hariri, too, was verbally humiliated and beaten, according to eight Saudi, Arab, and Western diplomatic sources. The man leading that interrogation? Saad al Qatani. France intervened to free Hariri, but Western capitals did not take Riyadh to task for detaining a head of government, and uh, Prince Mohammed emerged emboldened, according to these Saudi sources. This time is different, with some Western capitals increasingly critical of the murder and the Saudi explanation. Germany has announced it will stop arms sales, while Britain, France, and Germany issued a joint statement asking for, quote, an urgent clarification of exactly what happened October 2nd. President Trump has swung between saying he is unhappy with the Saudi investigation, but also that he does not want to jeopardize U.S. arms sales to the country. And, you know, we talked about that on the show the other day. 
Um, now we get to the Skype call. It says the stem, I'm sorry, to stem the fallout of the Khashoggi killing, the crown prince, commonly known by his initials MBS, allowed Katani to take the fall, according to one source close to the Saudi royal court. A second senior Saudi official said Katani had been detained following his sacking by royal decree, but he continued to tweet afterwards. The sources with links to the royal court said he was not believed to be under arrest. In the Khashoggi killing, Katani was present, as he has been in other key moments of MBS's administration. This time, though, his presence was virtual. Khashoggi, a U.S.-based Saudi journalist, often critical of Saudi Arabia and its leadership, walked into the Istanbul consulate at around 1 p.m. on October 2nd to pick up some documents that would allow him to marry. Uh, Turkish security sources said he was immediately seized inside the consulate by 15 Saudi intelligence operatives who had flown in on two jets just before, uh, just hours before. Um, 15 of them for this one dude. And then a fight broke out. Everybody was kung fu fight, fighting. And, uh, you know, what can you... And then uh, accidents happen. What can you do? You end up accidentally killing a guy. Um now, part of that might be, but let's assume for a moment that the uh, Saudi explanation of the fist fight gone wrong is real. Um, maybe uh, you shouldn't have 15 dudes beating up one guy. You know, that's like, uh, you know, I, I mentioned on the show briefly, you know, Gavin McGinnis and the Proud Boys and the violence and whatnot. You know, like if you got 15 Proud Boys beating up one uh, member of Antifa, what if... Uh, you know, what if that member of Antifa ends up dead? Now you got uh, 15 guys who uh, basically murdered someone. I mean, you know, things can spin out of control. Word to the wise. Uh, according to one high-ranking Arab source with access to intelligence and links to members of Saudi Arabia's royal court, Katani was beamed into a room of the Saudi consulate via Skype. He began to... Yeah, this is it never would have occurred to me to use Skype for this. And I wonder why they use Skype and is does Google Hangouts even still exist or, or did everybody just kind of collectively give up on that cuz it sucked so much. Um he began to hurl insults at Khashoggi over the phone. According to the Arab and Turkish sources, Khashoggi answered Katani's insults with his own, but he was no match for the squad which included top security and intelligence operatives. Some with direct links to the royal court. A Turkish intelligence source relayed that at one point, Katani told his men to dispose of Khashoggi. Bring me the head of the dog, the Turkish intelligence source says Katani instructed. Now, uh, I'm reminded of something John Hopwood said on the show. If someone uh, has a, uh, a diplomatic bag, you know, uh, you can't search those. So in other words, if these 15 guys... Maybe they had multiple bags, you know, not to be I don't want to get gruesome about it, but this is what may have happened. Right. Because there was talk of Khashoggi was dismembered and that's why no one can find him. Hopwood commented the other day that the, the body parts would. Ugh, it's so it's awful to even think about. I apologize. But he said, you know, you put the body parts in the diplomatic bags. Those cannot legally be searched as the Saudis are exiting the consulate. So in theory, no one would know what was in them. So that that's how they probably got him out of there. That's uh, and Hopwood had brought that up. I hadn't seen that in any of these articles, but it, it does make sense. Uh, Turkish intelligence source uh, relayed that at one point, Katani told his men to dispose of Khashoggi, bring me the head of the dog. The Turkish intelligence source said Katani instructed. It is not clear if Katani watched the entire proceedings, which the high-ranking Arab source described as a bungled and botched operation. Well, if it was bungled and botched, then, I mean, maybe there is truth to the idea that he that they didn't intend to murder him. But still. <laughs> See, that's, that's the, the thing about all this is, I was thinking about this earlier. Ultimately, the Saudis can come up with whatever whatever explanation they want to, right? They can try to soft pedal it however they want and say, well, we didn't mean to kill him. It was an accident. But he still died in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. There's no getting around that. So 
if he died in the Saudi consulate, his blood is on their hands no matter what. Now, if if you're then going to try to spin it as, well, these were 15 rogue killers who, who landed on a couple of jets and then they went to the Saudi consulate and they went, you know, well, why are they allowed to just go in? Nobody's checking their IDs. Nobody's stopping them at the door and saying, who are you? Oh, you're a rogue killer. Well, no, you're not allowed in the consulate because you're probably here to kill. I, I mean, I don't, I'm just saying, I know it's, I'm going into some absurdities here, but I'm just making the point that there's no way to put a nice face on this. The best the Saudis can hope to do, and this was clearly, this had to be the thinking behind this ridiculous fist fight story. I mean, again, I was being a little bit silly with it, and I'm, I don't I do not do that to make light of this man's death. I, I, if you heard my show Friday, you know how I feel about this and, and how appalled, which is not a strong enough word, but that's not the point. The point I'm just trying to make light. I am making light of the absurdity of the explanation and the way the Saudis are. Like, I wonder when they came up with this whole fist fight thing, was somebody sitting in a room and 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 they said, "Hey, I have an idea." You know, the uh, the the westerners in the U.S. You know, they like they have these movies called westerns where you see these uh, <laughs> you know these guys with guns. They they uh, break out into a fight in a saloon, a place called a saloon, and they're all beating each other up. And what if we went with something like that? That seems like something the Americans would buy. You know. They have movies where people break out into fights and in bars and and maybe something, you know, or maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, MBS. He might be a big fan of the movie Roadhouse <laughs> with Patrick Swayze. And he's like, yeah, 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 that that happens sometimes. These fights break out and then and, and somebody might uh, something could go wrong during a fight. Somebody could end up dead. Who knows? You know, somebody smashing a bottle over somebody's head. Who knows what could happen? Yeah, that's what we'll tell the Americans. Let's go with that because that's something they would understand. We'll say a fist fight broke out. They'll buy that. And then they'll be like, oh, okay. Well, don't worry about it then. <laughs> there's there's nothing. All they can do is try to spin it to make it less bad. But there's no way to make it not well, let me put it this way. There's no way to make it less bad enough that it doesn't still look really, really bad. No matter how they try to spin it, Khashoggi was in there when he died. His blood is on their hands. There's no getting around that. So it's just so interesting to me as, you know, as we learn more details about what may have really happened, um, with the backdrop of all these weird uh, <laughs> stories and, and, and the different uh, permutations these stories go through that they're uh, that they're coming up with as they try to uh, as they're, it's almost like they're stumbling in the dark trying to figure out something that we might accept that maybe the president can sell to everyone, which he seems to be giving up on. Trump seems to be giving up on soft peddling this because. Nobody is buying it, and his own party isn't letting him get away with it, and the other members of NATO aren't going to let him get away with it. Nobody's letting him get away with it at this point. So I think he's had no choice but to give in. And there may be voices within his own administration that are saying, Mr. President, you can't shrug this off. You know, and I talked on the show Friday about what does it say when he says to the rest of the world, well... We can't get too worked up about it. Uh, they do a lot of business with us. And then on top of that, you have the absurdity of him saying, but don't think there's a conflict of interest here. There's not. I don't do I don't have any business with the Saudis, never done any business with the Saudis. Meanwhile, there's all this video of Trump during the 2016 campaign saying, I love the Saudis. They buy hotels from me. They buy apartment buildings from me. They buy my casinos. They, uh, you know... <laughs> I go to visit Saudi Arabia and and there's, uh, well, I was going to make a joke about something similar that happens in Russia when he went there, but, which is all probably not even true anyway. So we won't go there. We're going to be a little bit, 
We're going to be a little bit better than that, which isn't easy for me to do to be better than that. That's uh, that's a hard that's a, a very high bar for me to try to reach. I'm not usually better than that, <laughs> but I'm making an effort. OK, so. Uh, The Arab source and the Turkish intelligence source said the audio, again, this is from Reuters, said the audio of the Skype call is now in the possession of Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, The sources say he is refusing to release it to the Americans. So from that, is that the same audio? Because remember, we keep hearing about this audio that Turkey allegedly has of Khashoggi being murdered. Is that the same audio? Is, is it the audio from the Skype call? And why is Erdogan refusing to release it to the Americans? That's interesting because Turkey, they've had no compunction up to this point about calling the Saudis on their BS in this instance and saying, no, 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 they're lying. They're clearly lying <laughs> when they say, oh, we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about what could have happened to him. And yet, they won't release the audio to the U.S. Why is that? Uh, Erdogan said on Sunday, yesterday, that he would release information about the Turkish investigation during a weekly speech uh, today, Tuesday. Oh, I'm sorry, tomorrow, rather. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Wow, I'm getting my days mixed up. Uh, Three Turkish officials uh, reached by Reuters declined to comment ahead of that speech. So what, is he going to reveal what's in the audio during the speech? That's kind of weird. The senior Saudi official who laid out the official version of events that Khashoggi had gotten into a fight said he had not heard about Katani appearing via Skype, but that the Saudi investigation was ongoing. Um, Now, this article goes on. I'm not going to to get into the whole thing. Well, at least we're going to skip this part of it. It talks about... Excuse me. It talks about Katani's rise to power in the Saudi kingdom. Um, but uh, as a uh, <laughs> as a henchman, uh, can we use that word? I mean, it, it, it sounds like that was to a large extent his role, a henchman for MBS. Right. Um, but we, we're, we're going to skip over that. But we want to get down to this part, a kidnapping. It says the extent of Katani's power is perhaps best illustrated by the kidnapping of Lebanese Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri last year. We talked about that. That was earlier in the article. Several of the Saudi and Arab diplomatic sources said, the Saudis were incensed at the inability of Harari, a Sunni Muslim and a Saudi client, to stand up to their uh, regional rival Iran and Hezbollah, the Shiite par... par, I always have trouble with that word. I don't know why. Paramilitary. In my mind, I, I want to say parliamentary. I don't know why, because they're obviously two very different things. Uh, the Shiite, and that word, by the way, I have to be very careful about how I say that on the air on FM radio. Sh- the Shiite paramilitary movement that acts as Tehran's spearhead in the region. Harari belonged to the same multi-party coalition government as Hezbollah. The Saudis were particularly dismayed that Hariri failed to deliver a message to a top advisor Uh, to Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to stop interfering in Lebanon and Yemen. Hariri claimed he had delivered the Saudi message, but an informer planted by Katani in Hariri's circle uh, gave the Saudis the minutes of the meeting, which showed that he had not done so. Well, that doesn't prove anything, by the way. Something can be uh, spoken, whispered in a corner, if you will, off the record. But uh, the Saudis lured Hariri to Riyadh for a meeting with MBS. Now, the, the reason this is all important is it shows that uh, this is nothing new to them. You know, that they, they, they are capable of of doing something like this, right? I mean, you know, without the whole murder part, but, you know, as, as far as kidnapping somebody, you know, they have no compunction about doing it, clearly. And this guy, Katani, has been involved in that, in doing MBS's bidding. So, you know, it, it's one, on the one hand, you know, you'll see, uh, like, uh, Tom Friedman, I saw him on television over the weekend. I saw a clip of him lauding MBS and saying how great the reforms are in Saudi Arabia and women can drive now and... Uh, 
Gucci. See, he, he went through a whole litany of things. Uh, there were five things total. I just remember that struck me as interesting. Five things. And um, that was one of them, women driving. There were some other things. But there, basically, there were five reforms happening in Saudi Arabia that Tom Friedman was, uh, you know, his attitude was, look, whatever else MBS may have done, look at the reform. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Look at what he's doing in Saudi Arabia. Look at the modernity that is occurring in Saudi Arabia, and that's laudable, and that's important to recognize. Okay, and he's not wrong. These things are all wonderful, but that doesn't make it okay to kill a journalist or uh, to kidnap Hariri as they did, or God only knows what other terrible things might be going on. And also... We know all the other terrible things that continue to go on. All these reforms are nice. Hey, I'm glad women can drive now in Saudi Arabia. But what about all the people who are having their heads chopped off? They still do beheadings in Saudi Arabia. Reforms are nice, but, you know, you can take hell And turn down the temp a little bit, but it's still hell. (sighs) What an... I I come up with the most awkward analogies and metaphors. I realize that about myself. Um, (laughs) You can take hell. Like, What am I talking about? Anyway, but but you get my point. (laughs) It is a weakness of mine. I'm terrible at at coming up with uh, metaphors for things, and I, I really am. But I do it anyway because I I know it I know it gives you all a good hearty chuckle to hear me fail miserably at talking. <laughs> uh, it gives my it gives myself a good hearty chuckle, so why not? Uh, let's see. All right, so the Saudis had lured Hariri to Riyadh for a meeting with MBS. And then when he got there on November 3rd of 2017, there was no lineup of Saudi princes or officials, uh, as would typically greet a prime minister on an official visit, at which point I assume Hariri, uh, Hariri thought, ruh <clears throat> Hariri later received a call that the meeting with the crown prince would take place the next day at a royal compound. When Hariri arrived, he was ushered into a room where Katani was waiting for him with a security team, according to three Arab sources familiar with the incident. Katani then said to Hariri, if anything goes wrong, uh, we're just going to claim it was a fist fight. I'm kidding. I made that part up. Uh, But the security team did beat Hariri. Katani cursed at him and then forced him to resign as prime minister in a statement that was broadcast by a Saudi-owned TV channel. Jeez, I mean, it's bad enough, you know, when when, uh, our enemies take prisoners of war— and they uh, get them to, under duress, look into a television camera and make these uh, false statements about, you know, denouncing America, this and that. And, of course, you know they're, they're only saying it because uh, they're going to be killed if they don't. But, but this is some hardcore stuff, right? Kidnapping Hariri and forcing him to resign. <laughs> uh, resign as prime minister uh, while under duress. That's... Uh, That's rough, man. That's rough. Uh, It says here, Katani told him you have no choice but to resign and read this statement. Katani oversaw the interrogation and ill treatment of of Harari, uh, said one of the sources. Another source said it was the intervention of French President Emmanuel Macron that secured his release following an international outcry. Well, yeah, you would think there would be an international outcry, yes. Macron uh, claimed credit in May for ending the crisis, saying an unscheduled stopover in Riyadh to convince MBS, followed by an invitation to Hariri uh, to come to France, had been the catalyst to resolving it. Lebanese officials confirmed to Reuters that Macron's quick intervention secured Hariri's return. Saudi officials could not be reached for comment about the sequence of events or Katani's involvement. French officials declined to comment when asked about Katani's role. So this this is the kind of thing that goes on under the auspices of the Saudi government and of MBS. So, again, the reforms are nice. WWE has their big crown jewel event on November 2nd in Saudi Arabia. 
And if you're a wrestling fan, it is exciting. Shawn Michaels, after eight and a half years, coming out of retirement for that. Okay. That's cool. Shout-outs to Eric if you're listening. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure Eric's excited about that. Oh, guys. Actually, Eric's not excited about that now that I think about it because I remember him calling recently and complaining about the old guys always coming back. Um, so, let's see. All right, a little bit more to this. This will kind of get us caught up, and then we'll move on to some other things, I promise. But uh, at least three – this gets into the what happened with Khashoggi and what led up to – because that's something that's kind of been lost in a lot of the story, I feel like. Uh, and there's some things I'm not clear on. What led up to Khashoggi going to Saudi Arabia? I mean, he went to the consulate, I guess, to get some paperwork that would allow him to remarry because his, his uh, first marriage had ended. But you've got to, uh, yeah, just like here, you know, sometimes you have to prove that you're legally divorced and you are eligible to get uh, remarried. And obviously, Khashoggi had been extraordinarily, especially in the um, in the final piece that Khashoggi had written before his death, he was extraordinarily critical uh, of MBS and the Saudis and their so-called reforms and so forth. So, but we haven't talked much about, and there's a lot that I don't know that we'll learn together now, if, if you don't know either, because I, I didn't get a chance to pre-read this, but... Uh, what led up to Khashoggi going there. And there is that question, too. A question that has been raised is, did U.S. intelligence know, as as it is believed that they did, did U.S. intelligence know that Khashoggi was in danger? Because if they knew and our government didn't say anything, because there is a law in place, apparently, that says... In a situation like this, where U.S. intelligence knows uh, an American, either an American citizen or an American resident, in Khashoggi's case, because Trump wanted to make that distinction very clear the other day, he's not a U.S. citizen. Not that that matters in this instance, it doesn't. But um, if U.S. intelligence knows that someone is in danger... There is an obligation, a legal obligation to tap that individual on the shoulder and say, hey, just so you know, before you go over there, you might end up dead. So maybe you ought not go there. And no one said a word. And Khashoggi went and ended up dead. That's a problem. If our government knew and didn't tell him, that's a problem. All right, so... Here's this part of it. Again, this is from Reuters. At least three friends of Khashoggi told Reuters that in the months after the journalist moved to Washington a year ago, he received multiple phone calls from MBS's right-hand man urging him to return to Saudi Arabia. Khashoggi had balked, they said, fearing reprisals for his Washington Post columns and outspoken views. Well, obviously, his fear ultimately justified. Uh, Katani had tried to reassure the former newspaper editor that he was still well-respected and had offered the journalist a job as a consultant at the royal court, the friends said. Khashoggi said that while he found Katani's gentle and polite, while he found Katani gentle and polite during those conversations, he didn't trust him, one close friend told Reuters. Quote, Jamal told me afterwards he thinks that I will go back so that he can throw me in jail, unquote. So at that point, Khashoggi thought that might be the worst that would happen to him. The second senior Saudi official confirmed that Katani had spoken to Khashoggi about returning home. The ambush in Istanbul seems to have been another way to get him home. Now, that's another element to this. Another little bit of a wrinkle in the story was the idea to kidnap him and keep him there. And that's where things went wrong. Now, again, based on everything we know, I'm not buying that. I think they, I mean, as has been pointed out, and again, we talked about it Friday on the show, uh, why would you bring a bone saw to a kidnapping? I mean, granted, I, I bring a bone saw with me to the studio uh, every day, but that's only in case I have people in here and things get out of hand. But um, it's amazing that it 
fits so well in my bag. But uh, I'm kidding, of course. I'm a klutz. I I, I don't even like uh, to eat food where I have to use a, a knife. I'll end up cutting off my. I'll end up dismembering myself. I'm very very clumsy. Um, but come on, they they must have intended to kill him. I mean, unless the bone saw was just in case. Something went wrong during the kidnapping and he ended up dead. Then we'll have to uh, go ahead and dismember him. But no, I, 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 don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it that they just... It was, it was just an innocent kidnapping that went wrong. I'm not buying that. I think they had every intention of killing him. Uh, let's see. The second senior Saudi official confirmed that Katani had spoken to Khashoggi about returning home. The ambush in Istanbul seems to have been another way to get him home. How much did the crown prince know about his trusted aide's plan to abduct Khashoggi? Most of the 15 hitman team identified by Turkish and Saudi authorities worked for the kingdom's security and intelligence services, military, government ministries, royal court security, and air force. One of them, General uh, Mayor uh, Mutreb, you know how awful I am with these names. A senior intelligence officer who is part of the security team of Prince Mohammed appeared in photographs with him on official visits earlier this year to the United States and Europe. The high-ranking Arab official and Turkish intelligence source said it was Mutreb's phone that was used to dial in Katani while Khashoggi was being interrogated. Reuters tried to contact members of the 15-man team, but their phones were either switched off on voicemail or no longer in service. Yeah, I don't imagine any of them are going to be speaking to the media do you <laughs> uh the saudi official and deputy intelligence chief uh general uh, ahmed al asiri put together the 15-man squad from the intelligence and security forces asiri was one of the five uh, officials dismissed on saturday i do struggle with these names why can't they have simple names like americans do like smith or jones or Papadopoulos, or, you know, just names that are very, very easy that I don't have to struggle with. So inconsiderate. Um, I'm going to kind of skip down here. So the Saudi official who spoke on Saturday said an existing standing order provided authorization to negotiate with dissidents to return home without requiring approval, but that the team involved with Khashoggi exceeded that authorization. So that's another little sort of uh, narrative within the larger story here that the Saudis, it's its kind of like the, there's all these little trial balloons, like let's see what they'll believe and what they won't. And they just could keep putting these little bits of information out there, these little ideas and theories. And one of them is, well, the uh, this, this team, these 15 guys, uh, they went rogue. D- to use Trump's term, rogue killers, they went rogue and kind of went a little too far. They were just supposed to kidnap him. They weren't supposed to kill him. Oops. What can you do? Uh, Another Saudi official close to the investigation said Katani decided. Excuse me. Katani decided on his own to organize Khashoggi's kidnapping and that he asked a Siri to get a team together, but that their plans had gone wrong. Katani's final act may be to serve his boss by assuming the responsibility for the crisis that has hit Saudi Arabia since Khashoggi's murder. The Saudi king has sacked Katani and ordered a restructuring of the General Intelligence Agency. Uh, there you go. All right. Now, there's another interesting wrinkle. To all of this, the uh, the uh, doppelganger. You know, they say everyone has a twin. But when I say they, I don't know who I actually mean. But um, there is a story. Let's see, I had it ready here. What did what did I do with it? There's a, there was a, a Saudi dressed as Khashoggi. To try to fool everybody. Uh, let's see. Maybe what we'll do is, because I had that pulled up. Um, now I'm having a hard time finding it. Maybe we'll go ahead and play that song. Derek sent. Uh, Derek Evan Relliford in the Facebook live chat sent us a song about uh, mental illness. Now this says... Um, Trevino, it goes. So, Derek, is Trevino the name of the band? Is that the name of your uh, 
your project. We'll go ahead and play this. He uh, he did assure me it is free of curse words because we are on FM radio. So it's about ten minutes to the top of the hour. We'll take our uh, we'll take our top of the hour break a little bit early. I am very anxious to hear this song, and then we'll uh, we'll come back and uh, maybe we'll do that story about the. Uh, about Khashoggi's double, or maybe we'll move on to some other things. Lord knows there is plenty going on. Whoops, there is plenty going on to discuss. And uh, I just heard my own voice coming through the board because somehow I managed to uh, turn the volume up on the Facebook live feed when I didn't mean to. All right. All kinds of fun tech issues today. Here we go. All right, so here it is. Uh, This is the uh, track that uh, David Evan Relliford just sent me. This is brand new. And it's called It Goes. Here on Matt Connerton, Unleashed in the Afternoon. This is a world premiere, my friends. Let's listen. That's great. I love that. Derek, thank you so much for sending that. Uh, That was uh, Derek Relliford, uh, who is in the Facebook live chat right now. His song, uh, It Goes. He says, uh, song by Derek Relliford, drums by David Schumard, uh, guitars, keys, and bass by Ian Relliford, mixed and mastered by Dustin Ritter. Um, Derek, uh, let us know where we can find that online and and more information about your project uh, online. If you've got, uh, I don't know if you have a website and a or a, a page or a, a Facebook page or, or for your band or whatever set up. But uh, please let us know, and, and we will definitely be playing that again in the very near future. Um, I love that. That's really good, dude. Great, great job. Um, hello to uh, Brian Brody, who also joins us in the Facebook live chat. Nice to see Brian in there. So, um, yeah, I decided to just well, – we will take a break in a couple of minutes, but um, I'll, I'll play some other stuff. But I wanted to uh, – so this is the story from – 
CNBC, obviously all the media is covering this, but uh, it says uh, Saudis reportedly scrap cover up plan because Khashoggi body double wore the wrong shoes. Um, so we'll wrap up this hour with this story because I wanted to uh, move on to some other things uh, in the second hour of the show today. But it says uh, an alleged Saudi Arabian plot to cover up the killing of dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi went awry after a suspected Khashoggi body double wore the wrong shoes. A diplomat familiar with the matter told The Washington Post, according to an article published today. So this is uh, somewhat breaking news here. The report came shortly after CNN published footage that appeared to show a man exiting the Saudi consulate in Istanbul October 2nd, wearing a fake beard and glasses, as well as the pants, shirt and jacket that Khashoggi was seen wearing when he entered the building earlier in the day. It was a flawed body double, so it never became an official part of the Saudi government's narrative, the diplomat told the Post. Well, so what does that tell you? That tells me they intended all along to kill him. They were prepared ahead of time. Well, then again. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously, whoever left could have just put on his clothes. But they had to have somebody. They had to have... uh, planned ahead they had to have planned ahead to have somebody there who could put on a fake beard and glasses and whatever else and look enough like him to fool everybody (laughs) right this had to have been premeditated they planned all along to kill him i definitely believe that now they planned all along to kill him and then they obviously planned to cover it up and this evidence that they were trying to cover it up just makes, I don't know about you, but it makes me believe even more that they intended to kill him the whole time. Because so often in, in, in situations, the cover-up is uh, ends up backfiring and uh, exacerbates uh, your problems caused by the original crime. The cover-up makes things even worse for you. Just ask Richard Nixon. Well, you, I mean, you can't because he's dead, but, you know, you look at Watergate. It, it, it was uh, the cover-up that did in Nixon, not the Watergate break-in itself. It says here, again, this is from CNBC.com. Uh, the report came shortly after CNN published footage that appeared to show a man exiting the Saudi consulate in Istanbul October 2nd wearing a fake beard and glasses, as well as the pants shirt and jacket that Khashoggi was seen wearing when he entered the building earlier in the day. The man was also captured on video at the Blue Mosque, a historic mosque and tourist attraction in the city. Oh, but I thought the Saudis were claiming that there was no footage of anyone leaving. Because remember, the Saudis at one point were claiming that the consulate in Istanbul, uh, yeah, it's got cameras running, closed circuit cameras, so we can keep an eye on what's going on. But we don't actually record anything. So we have we can't provide you any footage of him leaving because the cameras don't actually record anything. Oh, really? What about the footage you uh, have of him entering the consulate? How come you have that footage if the cameras don't record anything? And, oh, by the way, it's completely asinine, this explanation that the cameras don't record anything. Of course the cameras record everything. That's the point of having the cameras. It's not like you're a mall cop at Walmart watching a camera in a room to catch people shoplifting. Maybe you don't bother to record anything. You're just keeping an eye on things. It's not like that. It's an embassy in another country. You've got cameras recording everything. So, I mean, this really, you know, I mean, we already knew they were lying about that. At the very least, we knew they were lying about that. This just proves it. Oh, they got there's footage of the body double leaving. Where did that footage come from if they don't actually record anything? Hmm. Uh, the Saudi government has provided conflicting explanations. Well, that's uh, putting things uh, generously. Conflicting. Uh, for Khashoggi's killing, uh, for more than two weeks, officials claim to have no involvement in Khashoggi's disappearance over the weekend state media reverse course, saying Khashoggi was killed by accident in a fistfight involving a number of Saudi intelligence operatives. 
A Turkish official told CNN that the body double was used as a decoy, posing as the journalist to bolster the country's case that it was not involved in Khashoggi's killing. See, again, this is what I don't understand, though, about what, what Turkey is doing. They, they at, at every turn, at every turn, they are calling the Saudis on their BS, and yet they won't release the audio that they claim to have from that Skype call of Khashoggi being murdered. Now, maybe there's some other reason for that, or maybe it really doesn't exist. But it's just odd that, you know, everything else, they're right there shooting down everything that the Saudis try to try to put forth, but they won't release that audio. Maybe it's coming. Uh, let's see. According to the Washington Post report, the plan was soured by a, a satorial mishap. In the video footage, the purported body double, identified as Mustafa al-Madini, uh, uh, is wearing different shoes than Khashoggi wore when he entered the consulate. That's what'll get you every time is the shoes. You know, I read an article years ago in GQ, or it might have been uh might have been men's health or something. I think it was GQ that said that uh very often uh shoes are the first thing a woman notices about a man. So all they would have had to do is show the video to uh to a woman and uh she would have been like, Oh, look at that guy's shoes, they don't match. I don't know if that I'm, I'm skeptical that that's true, but I just remember reading that once years ago. That's the, the first thing a woman notices. Um, I, maybe maybe that's true for some women. I, I hope I hope women aren't uh, judging men by their shoes. That's uh, I mean, I, I got my shoes at Walmart. I don't want to be judged for that. Uh, let's see. It was a flawed dub, uh, body double, so it never became an official part of this. The narrative uh, Madani is suspected of working. For a Saudi intelligence agency, the Post reported, he appeared in New York earlier this year ahead of a diplomatic visit from Crown Prince MBS. The Saudi embassy in Washington did not respond to a request for comment from CNBC. The video footage provides more evidence that Khashoggi's killing was premeditated and also further implicates Crown Prince Mohammed, who has cultivated a close relationship with members of the Trump administration, including Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law. Well, they're about the same age, right? Uh, Kushner and uh, MBS. I can imagine them. I can imagine them hanging out together. You know, couple of boys, the boys balling. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, amid the uproar in Washington around the world over the killing of Khashoggi, who is a contributor to the Washington Post's opinion section, the White House has been divided over how to handle its response. A Trump who has been hesitant to take action that could disturb the close bilateral relationship or threaten U.S. arms sales to the country has been more outwardly critical of the Saudis in recent days. He said in an interview with The Post on Saturday that, uh, quote, there's been deception and there's been lies, unquote. That is probably the most forceful statement Trump has made. Uh, if you remember last week, he was in the Oval Office where he was sort of like, hey, you know, I don't know. They uh, they're going to buy a lot of stuff from us. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, yet others in the administration have been more cautious. On Monday, Kushner told CNN's Van Jones that the Trump administration remained in a fact-finding phase. He said, quote, we're obviously getting as many facts as we can from the different places, uh, and then we'll determine which facts are credible, unquote. Well, you know, they could find facts. They could find alternative facts. Hello to uh, Fred Bonig uh, from the dailyripple.org who joins us in the Facebook live chat. Well, it is a little bit uh, past the top of the hour, so we will uh, take a quick break and uh, I will play a little bit more music as we transition into uh, hour number two. And uh, I, uh, I want to hear some rage. How about you? I think it's uh, appropriate for a show like this. You're listening to Matt Connerton Unleashed in the Afternoon. We are live on WMNH 95.3 FM. Don't go away. Wow. 
Sit still. and Unleashed in the Afternoon, live on WMNH 95.3 FM and on Facebook via Facebook Live on the Matt Connerton Unleashed Facebook page. By the way, I, uh, I still haven't heard from anyone. If anybody knows what was going on in the city of Manchester earlier, like I said on my way here, I saw, I was counting them, I saw eight uh, uh, Manchester uh, police cruisers all headed toward the west west side of the city over the bridge. And I heard what sounded like even more sirens, and I think I heard uh, a uh, <clears throat> a fire truck, but I, I don't know what, but whatever it was, it was big. So if anyone knows, I just want to know. And uh, I just want to know that everything's all right. Um, the number to call, 603-250-6007. You can tell me about that or anything else that you'd like to discuss. 603-250-6007 is the number to call. Uh, anytime in the next uh, 47 minutes or so. And, of course, uh, you can also opine on the Facebook page, the Matt Connerton Unleashed Facebook page in the uh, live chat there. Uh, Derek says, uh, thanks for playing it. Yeah, if you missed it, uh, at about uh, 10 minutes of uh, 5 p.m., I played uh, Derek Relliford's uh, new song, and I will... Uh, I'll probably play that again tomorrow, but in a different place in the show. I'll probably, maybe I'll open the show with it. I, I do want to play that again because that's, uh, that's really, really good. And it's about mental illness, which is uh, a very uh, important issue that is prevalent. At, you know, if you're not suffering from some form of mental illness yourself, you certainly know somebody who, who is. Um, very, uh, very common. Um, I did want to get into some other things. Uh, we will leave uh, Khashoggi behind for now uh, unless there is some other... Uh, breaking news. Uh, I am uh, worried about this. Um, if you didn't hear, apparently Trump has decided uh, to uh, pull out. Oh, actually, we have a uh, Trump decided to pull out. That's a strange uh, uh, talking about an arms control uh, treaty. But let's grab this call. That's why I uh, stopped short there. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed in the Afternoon. Who's this? Hello? 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 Oh, hello, it's Eric. Eric, Eric. Do I know an Eric? Hello, guys. Oh, Eric Yagnon, yes. How are you, sir? <laughs> hey, I was online today in, in the, uh, speaking about wrestling earlier, and the, uh, they canceled the, that woman's evolution event this Sunday. What? They canceled that? Yeah, they said it. They said a lot. They said they don't, they're not saying why, but the, the reason is they probably didn't sell enough tickets, or they didn't have the people that, or well, the woman wrestlers didn't want to show up, or something. They they're not saying. I guess Ticketmaster said, "Get your refunds." You know, at the uh, at the uh, arena was supposed to be, I think, in New York or something. I am looking this up and right they now. They had a video about uh, on YouTube about the uh, some of the wrestlers don't want to go to Saudi Arabia now because of that, that mess with that guy who got beheaded there. Wow, this is really uh, kind of shocking to me. Yeah, uh, you're right, Eric. It says, uh, let's see. Ring- they're going to make up their mind pretty soon here because the event's on November second. That's around the corner. No, I'm sure the the crown jewel event that WWE is having in Saudi Arabia. I'm sure. I'm sure that's happening. Um, but uh, I mean, that's a lot of money know, for them. To- the that's a lot of money for them more to walk the, away from. What I read, because some of the wrestlers said they don't want to go. Yeah, I read that too. But publicly, you know, like I saw a video of Randy Orton being asked about it by uh, TMZ, and he was saying, "Well, you know, going helps, not going doesn't help." You know, and uh, no, I think they're going to do it. I mean, they've got a lot of they're, right. they're going to be losing a as massive as amount as of money. The, uh, fire, fire trucks and the uh, police. I hope there wasn't a big fire or a shooting. 
Well, I, I, the only thing I can think of that was opening on the west side of Manchester. Yeah, but it, it's you know in the middle of the day, it's, it's like. But I heard a lot of sirens. I mean, it was like uh, I thought it was. I, I, I thought it was Armageddon. Maybe it was a big fire or something. I don't know. Maybe. I was hoping you, you would know, the, uh, uh, Eric. The Care Robados from Manchester, England uh, website. I did not. I should check that because. Uh, yeah, there you go. Check that. See what happens. I gotta go. So we'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right, Eric Agnon leaves us. Uh, that opens up a line for you. Six zero three two five zero six zero zero seven is the uh, number to call. Six zero three two five zero six zero seven. Yeah, I'd really like to know. Uh, yeah, apparently uh, that uh, that other event that Eric uh, was talking about is canceled. WWB, uh, WWB, <laughs> WWE, uh, their uh, event evolution, uh, an all women's uh, pay per view they were going to have is uh, canceled. That's very very strange. Um. All right. Well, my goodness. Well, speaking of strange. Actually, I'm very concerned about this. Like I said, uh, Trump has decided to uh, pull us out of a decades-old uh, nuclear treaty with Russia, the uh, the one country in the world that uh, really has the capability to uh, completely uh, incinerate the United States uh, in a matter of minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, not to put too fine a point on it. But, uh, yeah, Trump has uh, said we're pulling out of that. Uh, the Hill.com reports, uh, according to the Pentagon, Trump and Mattis are completely aligned on Russia arms treaty withdrawal. Um, and the reason that's relevant is because people kind of um, – there's kind of this thing where people de- sort of depend on uh, James Mattis in a way. Mad Dog Mattis, as he's been referred to in the past. People think that he's kind of a stabilizing force in terms of Trump's foreign policy and keeps helps keep Trump from going over the edge. And there was even speculation that Mattis may have been responsible for the anonymous op ed and the New York Times and so forth. Um, But apparently Mattis is on board with this. It says here this is from the Hill dot com. Uh, The Pentagon today said Defense Secretary James Mattis and President Trump are completely aligned on the commander in chief's abrupt decision to announce that the country will pull out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, with Russia. Colonel Rob Manning told reporters at the Pentagon, quote, Secretary Mattis and the president talk a broad range of issues uh, continuously. And their position on this particular issue is aligned, uh, Colonel uh, Rob Manning told uh, reporters at the Pentagon. Uh, Fred Bonig from the DailyRipple.org in the Facebook live chat says, Visit soon because they will soon be closed to public when we stick new missiles in these tubes again. Oh, and there's a... Uh, he put a link to something here. I'm going to click that link in the uh, Facebook live chat. Uh, yeah, uh, from, uh, nps.gov. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Check, check that out. If you'd like, if you're listening, uh, on Facebook or, or if not too, if you're interested in any of these links that we're putting in the Facebook live chat, but say you're traveling in your vehicle, you can always go to the Matt Connerton unleashed Facebook page afterward and, uh, go into the, the Facebook live chat and see some of this stuff. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, Mattis, who was traveling in Asia last week and returned Saturday, was reportedly blindsided by Trump's announcement. Well, not the first time that's happened. I think we all kind of feel that way sometimes, don't we? Actually, I'm reminded of when Trump, remember, I mean, it, it seems like it was uh, so long ago now. There's so much time distortion with the Trump presidency. I always say, doesn't it seem like he's been president for like a decade? Uh, but remember when Trump did the, the announced on Twitter the transgender ban in the military, and Mattis was uh, allegedly uh, blindsided by that. Uh, hello, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed in the afternoon. Who's this? It's your old pal Fred. What I sent you was the um, links in South Dakota. You can go to the old Minutemen si- silos because part of the agreement was they were allowed to keep. I think maybe one or two of them actually. There, oh. not operative, but people could go and look at, at them for historic purposes. Oh. And there's one in Russia 
the same that they had because they ended all the uh, those ground based, you know, the land based nuclear missiles. Yeah. So that you can go there and be go into those places, and we, I mean, I've been there. It's really cool. It's this. You go down. They have these like ranch style buildings, like houses, like a ranch style house. And then you go inside, and then you go down this elevator that goes way down in the ground. And then in, under the ground, there's this room that's built on, like a big, like a capsule that's got big steel doors and everything, and it has. Um, it's built on shock absorbers in the ground. So they can it can take a direct hit like, you know, pretty close. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. That, that was what they Yeah, and and there's only like one in the United States because we had to fill them all in. Right, right. That okay. was part of the agreement, but they left one for educational purposes or historical purposes, one here and one in Russia. Oh. So if you need you you probably should go visit them now <laughs> because you won't be able to get in again soon. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't know about any of that. Huh. Oh, very cool. But, but here's the question: hmm. Why is you know? I, I have heard it many times. Vladimir Putin says he's not doing this. Why are we not taking his word? He said he's not doing it. We took his word on everything else. Right. <laughs> why? Why is he a liar on this and not on anything else? Yeah, that is uh, interesting. Uh, right? Because, I mean, it's obviously Putin said, you know, well, I'm not doing anything. I mean, he came out and said that and said, this is a bad thing for you to do. <laughs> do you think Trump is just... Yeah, he did just yesterday or today yeah. or whatever. In his speech, he was like, I'm, we're not doing... We're not breaking this treaty. Right. And, and he, he said it strongly. I'm sure he said it strongly and forcefully. Well, here's the difference, though, Fred. Let's be fair now. Here's the difference. He didn't say it to Trump directly in a room together, like look him in the eyes and say it. You think this just came up and they didn't mention this in the in that room when they had that hour-long conversation about, you know, when, when they rolled the tape of, uh, <laughs> of, of, the, of the, the killing of Kennedy... <laughs> and it had a very odd angle from like the grassy knoll when he played that for Donald Trump in that room for uh, an hour. And, and he realized, oh, no, I'm in for a pint and a pound. Well, Trump was too busy looking for Rafael Cruz in the background when Kennedy was being shot. Oh, yeah. Yes, he was. Yes. Well, I wonder, <laughs> do you think Trump is just doing this to inoculate himself from charges that he's not tough enough on Russia? Do you think that's I mean, this whole thing seemed to come out of nowhere. Well, it did, but it's 14 days before the end of before the uh, before the end election. of the world. No, that's why. Oh, the end of the ele- oh the election. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, anything that comes out now is uh, is like is just you know they're going to put a tax plan in by November 1st, except that nobody's there. <laughs> right. <laughs> They've all gone home. They're all campaigning. They all went home. What do you think? They're all they're all going to come back the week before election and and work, do business, right? Right. And put together this plan. (laughs) You know, because that doesn't take but a day, right? Because you just scratch it on the side of a paper. You just take an old plan and you just cross off the other stuff. (laughs) Whatever you write on, it's fine. We're not even going to vet it. We're just just sign it. We got to get home. Are you talking about Trump's new uh, ten percent middle class uh, tax cut? Yeah, why not? Yeah, give everybody ten percent. Maybe he can do that by executive order. You know, uh, he, he hey, you know, I, I say he has the he has the House, yeah, the Senate, the presidency, and the Supreme Court. What can't he do? That's right. That's right. And anything he can't do is can only be blamed on him. If there's any problems at all, <laughs> he ha- uh, really. I mean, think about it. If you're the president and you have control of all all the branches of government, then why is not everything your fault? How do you, how can you honestly blame it on anybody? Well, if there's a caravan of Hondurans coming your way, you blame George Soros. There's always people to blame. Well, you know, the interesting thing about that was that the um, Washington Post put out a, you know, the, the U S government said the reason why they're coming, I mean, this is, this is the Trump administration is because Guatemala has a huge starvation problem. I mean, there's very little food. It's real. The people, 70% of the children there in Guatemala are 
are, are suffer from starvation, 70%. Mm-hmm. The, it's the, one of the, the poorest nations in the world when it comes to uh, in, in, inequity between the rich and the poor. Yeah. They can't, people can't even buy basic food. Right. That's why they're coming. Right. Because, you know, and, 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 the, and the Trump administration, you know, maybe not at the top where he talks, <laughs> but the people who actually know what's going on and run the government, that's what they said. Right, right, exactly. That is hunger. Uh, and, and then he wants to send the military there, which, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I get into a lot of these agreements, you know, disagreements, uh, agreements, uh, sure, <laughs> they, um, on the Internet, and, and they're all like, we should send the military. And I'm like, okay, are you sending your child to go shoot that first hungry, wo- you know, mom holding the baby that just walked 3,000 miles? Is it you going to have your kid do the first pull that trigger? Is that you know, or you you know who who are you sending to do that? Since you want to send the military to protect our country from hungry moms and kids and and teenagers and you know unarmed people, you I want to you know you need the military to shoot them right to stop them from yeah. invading. Yeah, but just to play devil's advocate, Fred, what if that mom and that starving child are uh, also happen to be members of MS-13? And they might be rapists. It's going to be hard. They're pretty tired. They just walk 3,000 miles and they're starving to death. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way. I mean, you're right. you know. Yeah, that's true. You walk 3,000 miles and tell me how much butt you're going to kick. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I probably... I mean, uh, you know, if they're yeah. eating anything, it's not like they're, uh, they're you know... And the best part is they can travel about 24 miles a day. So they have to go, you know, almost 24,000 miles, 2,400 miles. How many days does that take? I'm terrible at math, but it's a lot. Yeah, well, it's a lot more than an election, let me tell you. It's a lot more than 14 days. (laughs) That's true. That's a good point, yeah. So, you know, this whole thing, they're doing it so they can arrive on election day. They better get a ride. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're gonna need you're gonna need some of those um, those tractor trailers, you know. Right, right. Oh goodness. That's why I just wanted to say that. Just to, and nice to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Fred. Always, uh, always a pleasure. And you should uh, plug the Daily Ripple. Well, the Daily Ripple now is uh, is we're at fifty one thousand of all websites in the U.S. Wow. Okay. But, we have an average time on the site, 25 minutes. 14 page clicks is our average. And we have a bounce rate, which the higher the number, the worse it is. Like Rolling Stone has an 80% bounce rate. Yeah. People go to the site and leave without clicking on it. Yeah. We have a 19% bounce rate. Wow. That's 19%. excellent. That is excellent, Fred. Wow. You're kicking ass. Yeah, that's really good because that means people are going – and the, and, the, and the key to success is there's no advertising on the site. Right, right. Well, good for so you. You don't get bombarded with – you know, that's the thing that drives you off the site. You know, things popping up. and Oh, I got to buy this. Oh, yeah. Just news. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, good for you, Fred. That's fantastic. The TheDailyRipple.org. That is wonderful. Yep. Well, keep up the good work, my friend. I'll be keep listening to you. All right. Thanks, Fred. Great to hear from you, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was uh, Fred Bonig from the dailyripple.org. Please check out his site. And uh, Fred, feel free to pop a link to that, too, in the Facebook live chat. Um, So just kind of getting back to this a little bit. This is from thehill.com. It says... um, Pressed on whether Trump had discussed his decision, and again, we're talking about Trump's decision to, uh, we're pulling out of a decades-old, uh, the INF treaty with the Russians. Uh, this kind of thing really uh, concerns me. Uh, pressed on whether Trump had discussed the decision with Mattis directly beforehand, Manning would only say that, quote, the secretary is always accessible, obviously, and he remains in close contact with the president, unquote. So obviously that's a no. Trump did not uh, discuss that with uh, Secretary Mattis. Uh, Trump on Saturday night told reporters he wanted to pull out of the three-decade-old treaty with Russia, the pact established in 1987 during the uh, Reagan presidency. Remember, Reagan and Gorbachev had a very uh, good relationship, and they uh, got a few things accomplished there. Uh, The pact uh, 
established in 87 during the Reagan administration, bans the U.S. and Russia from processing or testing land-based missiles with a range of 310 uh, to uh, 3,400 miles, but allows for research. And Fred did drop that uh, link in there. Thank you, Fred. So I, I would encourage everyone in the Facebook live chat to check that out. Uh, U.S. officials have said Russia is in violation of the treaty, a charge Russia denies. Speaking to reporters after a rally in Nevada, Trump said Russia has been in violation of the INF treaty for many years. Trump said, quote, we're going to terminate the agreement and we're going to pull out. We'll have to develop those weapons, unquote. Oh, God. I don't feel good about any of this. I kind of, I, I you know, it, it, it's a feeling kind of similar to when he said we're going to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, just um, about 100,000 times worse. Uh, Mattis earlier this month called Russia's violation of the treaty untenable, but indicated that the U.S. would press Moscow to comply, not pull out altogether, which seems like a more reasonable course of action, doesn't it? Uh, Mattis had said, quote, Russia must return to compliance with the INF treaty or the U.S. will need to respond to its cavalier disregard of the treaty's specific limits. The United States is reviewing options in our diplomacy and defense posture to do just that in concert with our allies, as always, unquote. So there you go. We'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that. That is, um, like I said, that's a, a little uh, a little bit uh, concerning to me. Uh, referring to what uh, Fred was talking about with the tax cuts, uh, Trump says this is from the dot com. Trump says he will push for a new round of tax cuts after the midterms. Um, you know, I, I'd made reference to uh, while Fred was on the line with us at. Uh, Trump had said something about a 10 percent middle class tax cut. Uh, President Trump said Monday he will push for a vote on a second round of tax cuts during the lame duck session of Congress following the midterm election. Trump told reporters at the White House, quote, uh, we're doing it now for middle income people. This is not for business. This is for middle. We'll do the vote after the election, unquote. The president said he will put forth a proposal in the next two weeks that will include a 10 percent reduction for middle class Americans. Trump over the weekend caused confusion when he said the new round of tax cuts would be introduced, quote, sometime just prior to November. So that's what Fred was referring to when Fred was saying, you know, look, they're they're all gone. They've all left. You know, they're not going to be back before the midterms because, you know, Congress, they're all off campaigning. They've got, uh, you know, they've got uh, hands to kiss and babies to shake. You know, they're not. uh, Yes, I know. I said that backward. I did that intentionally. Uh, Maybe that isn't. I don't know. Shaking babies. Maybe that isn't funny. I'm already filled with remorse at that joke. But uh, anyway, the House is currently out of session and will reconvene again on November 13th. Trump often touts his first round of tax cuts, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, as one of the administration's major legislative victories. The law, a major overall of U.S. tax policy, consisted of a tax cut on individuals and corporations. Trump on Saturday differentiated the two plans, saying the latest is, quote, is not for business at all, unquote. Senator Tom Tillis, Republican of North Carolina, on Sunday agreed that a second round of tax cuts could plunge the country deeper into debt. Oh, my goodness. Tom Tillis pointing that out. I thought the Republican Party had completely uh, changed their minds on that and said, no, deficits don't matter. I thought I literally and I'm not saying that to be flippant or sarcastic. I'm being quite genuine here when I say this. I thought that the new position of the Republican Party was deficits don't matter. Just print more money. Just keep printing money. It doesn't matter anymore. Oh, unless you want, you know, Medicare for all or something like that, in which case there's no possible way we could ever pay for that. But we'll give you all the tax cuts you could possibly want. And uh, by the way, we always have plenty of uh, money uh, for the military industrial complex and Oh, don't worry about the deficit when it comes to any of that. We'll just print more money. It's all good. Just look the other way. <laughs> Except on Election Day. Make sure you vote for us. Right? Uh, let's see. He also said, quote, again, this was Tom Tillis. We've got to make sure that it's at least supported by facts around dynamic growth. It has to pay for itself. We can't go further into debt. Why do you care about this all of a sudden, Tom Tillis? 
I know for a fact you didn't care at all uh, when we did the prior tax cut. Uh, Let's see. An August report from the Congressional Budget Office showed that the federal deficit jumped 20 percent in the first 10 months of the 2018 fiscal year, largely due to the Republican backed tax cuts. Oh, yeah. At the time, you know, Paul Ryan even admitted nobody really knows how this is going to go. You know, when asked, how is it possible that these tax cuts are going to uh, are going to grow the economy so much that any shortfall in revenue will be made up for because of all the economic growth? How is that possible? And Paul Ryan said, well, you know, it may not be. (laughs) This may not work out. Oh, well, whatever. It's just stunning. And, and of course, look, if in 2020 we get a, a Democrat in the White House, you know what the Republican tune will be then. All of a sudden, deficits will matter all over again. Because even though deficit, deficit spending actually went down under President Obama, which they won't tell you, but, of course, they were constantly— I mean, look, we almost wrecked the global economy by going over the fiscal cliff when, uh, back in 2011, all this nonsense started where the debt ceiling or the debt limit or the, uh, you know, what, whatever term you want to use. Um, there's a third term that I hear sometimes used for that uh, that I, I can't quite recall. But, uh, what, you know, when we started—when when that became a bargaining chip, right, in partisan politics— that we might actually go over the fiscal cliff. We might actually go into default for the first time in our nation's history, which would send the global economy off of a cliff. I mean, we're talking a global economic Armageddon, and I, I don't speak hyperbolically when I say that. That's how severe it would be. We actually started to play chicken with that possibility because Republicans, particularly this Tea Party wave of Republicans who had gotten elected to the House, they were like, oh, no, we spend too much money. Let's go ahead and default, which is nuts. If you want to cut down on spending, you cut down on spending in the budget. You don't say, well, we're not going to raise the debt limit because we're not going to pay on uh, you know, the interest on the money that we already spent and then send the, the country into default. That's insanity. But they were willing to do it or at least threaten to do it because they were so worried about debt and the deficits and we're out of money and we can't keep deficit spending. So we're just going to blow the whole thing up. What a difference a few years make. Now, deficits don't matter. They finally took what Dick Cheney said all those years ago during the W administration. They finally took that to heart and said, you know what? Dick Cheney was right. Ah, Deficits don't matter. You just print more money. Who cares? Fred says sequestered. Oh, sequestration. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Maybe we should uh, sequester Tom Tillis. Ha, <laughs> The little joke there. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, Fox News had on... Uh, oh, Fred posted something. Oh, let's see. Fred just posted a link that looks interesting in the uh, Facebook live chat um, from the New York Times. This was from uh, October 8th, 2013. <laughs> Yeah, I remember this, Fred. Yes, I don't. I don't mean I remember this article specifically, but this had been, this had become the uh, the theory in the in the uh, Republican Party. Again, this is from October 2013, so five years ago. Uh, it says uh, many in GOP offer theory default wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> this is how they justified it, saying default wouldn't be that bad if the United States, for the first time in the history of the country, defaulted on the full faith and credit of the United States. By just saying, no, we're done. We're not going to pay any pay our bills anymore. And you know what was particularly horrifying to me about that whole period? I mean, it still goes on, by the way, but but much less. It started in the summer of 2011, I believe. Um, so you had this wave of Tea Party Republicans who were elected who, as far as I can tell, literally did not understand the difference between the debt limit and the federal budget and were so ignorant that they actually thought that they were the same thing and they're not. So they wanted to 
vote against raising the debt limit or the debt ceiling. That's the other term I was looking for, the debt ceiling. They wanted to vote against raising it and send the country into default because they they literally, some of these people, they, they, they don't know the difference. And there are voters who don't know the difference. Trust me, I've had plenty of conversations with them, with, with, with people who don't know the difference. The federal budget is exactly what it sounds like. It's how much money you're going to spend for this and this and that and that over there, right? It's how much money you're going to spend. That's a budget. The debt limit allows you to continue to borrow money so you can service that debt. It's money already spent. Think of it this way. Let's say you decide in a given month, You're spending too much money. You're looking at your electric bill. uh, You're looking at your cell phone bill, whatever it may be, and you're going, spending too much money. I got to cut this down. So what do you do? You try to budget. Maybe you try to use less uh, electricity. Maybe you try to find a better cell phone plan, whatever it is, so that you can lower your budget for those things, so that you're not spending as much. That is the logical, reasonable thing to do, right? On the other hand, here's what you don't do, and this is what would be analogous to uh, default. You don't say, you know what? I spent too much money this month, so I'm just not going to pay these bills. There, there you go. I just won't pay the bills because I spent too much. Well, what's going to happen if you do that? Catastrophe. Your electricity is going to get shut off and your phone is going to get shut off because you didn't pay the bills. That's the best analogy I can come up with. That's the difference between the budget and the debt ceiling. And we actually, forgive me for being so blunt, but we live in a country where we actually elect people our elected lawgivers and overlords, we actually elect people who are so unbelievably, irretrievably stupid that they don't even know the difference between the budget and the debt limit. They literally don't know the difference and will say things like, well, we're spending too much money. Why should we keep spending all this money? We elect, I mean, it's bad enough, you know, it, it, as someone who does understand the difference, it can be challenging trying to explain it to someone who doesn't understand the difference. But the idea that we actually elect people, we actually put people in charge who are that unbelievably stupid is just... I, I try not to even think about it too much because it makes me feel like there is no hope. I can't believe we've gotten this far as a country without completely falling apart given the the incredible lack of quality of the people that we put in charge of stuff (laughs) who will ultimately it's bound to happen at some point they will destroy us completely because they're literally too stupid not to because we're literally too stupid not to elect people who are stunningly stupid (laughs) rather than electing smart people we elect dumb people so i guess in the end we really do get the government that we deserve But, uh, yeah. So that's the difference between the two. And, uh, yeah, it says here, actually, we'll read a little bit of this. I know we're almost out of time, but uh, this uh, New York Times article from uh, 2013, it says, uh, Senator Richard Burr, Republican of North Carolina, a reliable friend of business on Capitol Hill, said no one's idea of a bomb thrower, I'm sorry, and no one's idea of a bomb thrower isn't buying the apocalyptic warnings that a default on United States government debt would lead to a global economic cataclysm. He said, we've all we always have enough money to pay our debt service. You've had the federal government out of work for close to two weeks. That's about twenty four billion dollars a month. Every month you have enough saved in salaries alone that you're covering three fifths, four fifths of the federal debt service, about thirty five billion a month. That's manageable for some time. Yeah, dummy, maybe it is manageable for some time, but not indefinitely because you're going to run out of money and everything's going to fall apart. Uh, I don't I don't want to get too far back into this because it just it it, like I, I mean, 
not only is it frustrating, but like I said, just it, it it's just a, of any issue that I can think of, it's just such a, a stark reminder of the lack of quality of the people that we put in charge. Like, I'm not an economist. I'm not even good at math. I failed college accounting the first time I took it. I say it all the time. And yet I can understand these very basic concepts. And yet we we elect knuckle-dragging morons who think it wouldn't be a big deal to default because they can't understand these very basic concepts. Like, I think I'm a reasonably smart guy, but I'm not some genius who has somehow figured something out that a lot of other people haven't. Yet I understand this. <laughs> but we put people in charge who don't get it. By the way, here, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll say something nice about President Trump here. Trump, from uh, everything I've seen him say about this issue, he gets it, and he has surrounded himself with people who get it. Trump understands you can't allow the country to default. He has said that on more than one occasion when the issue of the debt limit has come up, that that cannot be allowed to happen. Trump gets it. Steve Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, he gets it. He's surrounded himself with people who actually get it, which is good because it's really important. (laughs) Because if we ever do default, it's the beginning of the end of everything. It would be a global economic cataclysm. Virtually any economist will tell you that. I know there's all different kinds of economic theory. You know, you've got the supply siders on the right. You've got the Keynesians on the left. You've got, uh, all, you know, you've got all kinds of economic theory, right? It's called theory for a reason. It's not an exact science. It's all theory. But virtually any economist will tell you the United States must never be allowed to default on its debt. Almost any economist will tell you that, regardless of what economic theory they ascribe to. Or subscribe to, rather. So... And yet we elect idiots who don't get it. It's so scary. It really is. It's very, very scary. Hello to uh, Chris Rose, who joins us in the uh, Facebook live chat. Um, Let's see here. I wanted to... um, Yeah, let's do this quickly. So we did talk a little bit, too, about the caravan. Um, Fox News, uh, uh, surprisingly, I'm surprised they let this air. Uh, Steve Dushy. Uh, from uh, Fox and Friends. I'm still never sure I'm saying his name correctly, but he uh, sat with a panel of independent voters. Uh, this is from Mediaite. Fox News panel of independent voters rejects caravan fear-mongering, saying that this is a humanitarian crisis. Like I said, I'm uh, a little bit surprised in a way that, that Fox allowed this to air, but I'm going to play the audio for you. It says, uh, this happened on Fox and Friends. Uh, Steve Dushi interviewed a panel of independent voters this morning and ask them about the caravan of Honduran immigrants uh, that has been turned into a uh, political issue ahead of the midterm elections. And um, here's what they had to say. Uh, Listen to this. 32% lean Republican and 22% are pure independent. One of the big stories right now is this uh, migrant caravan that is... uh, heading toward the United States. Right now, it's, it's uh, north of apparently 7,000 people strong. Just curious, Michael, let's start with you. How big a problem is that, that the United States has uneven immigration laws? I, I think uneven immigration laws uh, are a problem for any country. Uh, and I think our immigration laws uh, need to be modernized and updated. Uh, uh, but this country is founded on immigration, and all of us come from immigrants. Sure. So what should the United States do if those 7,000 people, uh, by the time it gets here, it could be 10,000, it could be 20,000. What should the United States do about those people? This is the mightiest country on the planet. I think we can handle uh, an, uh, a, a caravan of people unarmed coming to this country. So let them in. And, well, I, I'm saying to process them properly. Right. Okay, Kathy, real quick. Real quick, I think that the immigration crisis that we're seeing is a result of the failure of the two Democratic parties to actually engage the issue. Mm -hmm. Instead, they use it like a partisan football. But I have to challenge the idea that independents are leaners. I think that no political party owns independent voters. The leaner question tries to put us back in the box, the very box that we jumped out of. You don't like that. John, real quick, on the immigration. There's a humanitarian crisis taking Mm -hmm. place in Central America, and yet... 
this issue gets turned into a complete political football. There's very little honest discussion about what's actually happening. It gets turned into talking points. And Aaron. Yeah, treating, um, treating this as an invasion is, is a bad idea and it's going to end horribly if it is treated such as that way. So I, I think people have to realize, yeah, these, these are human beings coming here and there needs to be a real solution mm -hmm. um, that, offered um, in, in dealing with it. Sure, but the backdrop is the midterms, and so it all becomes political. Let's see what happens. Great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. All, right, uh, all right, so that was from Fox and Friends. Uh, SE Cup on uh, CNN uh, criticized Trump today for, uh, this is also from Mediaite, for using the immigrant uh, caravan as a political cudgel ahead of the midterm elections while failing to propose solutions on the issue. Well, he did propose one thing. He proposed uh, <laughs> sending the military there, but like, you know, as providing over a city that's out well, of control in terms of crime. Uh, you know, when you have the record sorry. number of murders, in fact, oh, the guy man. running to succeed him as mayor uh, was his former chief of staff. And he's sending out literature to voters saying, oh, my goodness. Sorry about that. It's been a day of uh, technical issues here. <laughs> I did not. Uh, I was going to play that SC Cup audio, but I had to close that out to uh, get whatever was playing that wasn't supposed to be playing to close out. That was my fault. I think I didn't. Uh, I didn't close out something I should have closed out. You know, it's important to close things out. That's what uh, my grandfather used to tell me. That, of course, he had dementia. Um, let's see. We've got a few minutes left, so we'll, we'll actually we'll get into. A, into one more uh, quick thing here. Let's see. Um, this is interesting. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about China much lately, but uh, for some reason, now this is from Reuters. Uh, U.S. warships pass through Taiwan Strait amid China tensions. Uh, this just happening. Uh, the U.S. sent two warships through the Taiwan Strait on Monday in the second such operation this year, as the U.S. military increases the frequency of transits through this, the uh, strategic waterway, despite opposition from China, the voyage risks further heightening uh, tensions with China, but will likely be viewed in self-ruled Taiwan as a sign of support by Trump's government amid growing friction between Taipei and Beijing. Reuters was first to report U.S. consideration of the sensitive operation on Saturday, uh, Commander Nate Christensen, uh, deputy spokesman for U.S. Uh, Pacific Fleet, said in a statement, quote, the ship's transit through the Taiwan Strait demonstrates the U.S. commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. The U.S. Navy will continue to fly, sail, and operate anywhere international law allows, unquote. Taiwan's defense minister said it closely monitored the operation and was able to, quote, maintain the security of the seas and the airspace as it occurred, unquote. There was no immediate comment from China. I don't imagine they will say anything. Uh, the U.S. Navy conducted a similar mission in the Strait's international waters in July, which had been the first such voyage in about a year. The latest operation shows the U.S. Navy is increasing the pace of Strait passages. Washington has no formal ties with Taiwan, but is bound by law to help it defend itself and the island's main source of arms. Which kind of is a formal tie <laughs> to Taiwan, I, I think. Uh, the Pentagon says Washington has sold Taiwan more than $15 billion in weaponry since uh, 2010. Yeah, if you remember, and I think it, it, it for some reason it had come up on the show recently. I was talking about when uh, when George W. Bush... Uh, became president, um, there was a, you know, this had been forgotten about relatively soon after it happened, but he was a little bit inexperienced in matters of foreign policy, and someone had asked him in an interview, what would the U.S. response be if China were to move on Taiwan? And Bush said, well, we would defend Taiwan militarily, which was the wrong answer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody kind of had their head in their hands because what Bush failed to understand is, and I guess, I mean, you know, probably, a, I guess a sincere mistake, but, um, you know, there's this concept of strategic ambiguity where you don't necessarily want your enemies to know exactly how you'll respond in any given situation because it keeps them off balance. So it had always been the policy up to that point of the United States that we don't say out loud what we would do if China were to move on Taiwan. We allow the Chinese to kind of wonder about it. And then uh, when the time comes, hopefully it never does. But if the time comes, we'll have to deal with it. But in the meantime, 
Uh, let the Chinese wonder. That keeps them off balance because we want to be seen as unpredictable. Bush, I guess, didn't know that, answered the question, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, you know, he took a lot of criticism for that. I, I mean, I, I guess it didn't do any long-term harm. Uh, all right, getting back to this, uh, again, this is from Reuters. China views Taiwan as a wayward province and has been ramping up pressure to assert its sovereignty over the island. It raised concerns over U.S. policy toward Taiwan in talks last week with U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis in Singapore. As the United States prepared for a fresh passage through the strait, it told China's military that its overall policy toward Taiwan was unchanged well, until geez, until Trump just decides one day to change it and announce it on Twitter. Uh, Mattis delivered the message to China's defense minister. You know how much I love these names. Wei Fangi? Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to call him Wei. We'll call him by his first name. His name's Wei. Uh, personally, on uh, Thursday, on the sidelines of an Asian security forum. I can do I actually know the guy personally. I know Wei personally, so I can get away with that. We're buds. Oh, I guess Wei is his last name. That's right, because they they in Asia, it's, they're like Klingons. They put their last name first and their first name last. Uh, I think that's in deference to uh, the Klingons. Uh, they're big Star Trek fans. Is that racist, that whole joke? I don't know. I don't think it is. Uh, There was no intent uh, as such with that. Uh, Quote, Minister Wei uh, raised Taiwan and concerns about our policy. The secretary reassured Minister Wei that we haven't changed our Taiwan policy, our one China policy, unquote. The one China policy, of course, referring to the policy that there should be one China, that everyone should be united. Just like, you know, we'd like to see with, I don't know, do we really want that with Korea? Korea? I don't know. Um, That was a quote from uh, Randall Shriver. See, these American names are so easy. Randall Shriver, a U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense who helps guide Pentagon policy in Asia. Uh, He said, quote, so it was, I think, a familiar exchange. Uh, Taiwan is only one of a growing number of flashpoints in the U.S.-China relationship, which also includes a bitter trade war, U.S. sanctions, and China's increasingly muscular military posture in the South China Sea. Taiwan's relations with China have deteriorated since the island's president, oh boy, Tsai Ing-wen, from the independence-leading Democratic Progressive Party, swept to power in 2016. Beijing, which has never renounced the use of force to bring Taiwan under its control, responded to the July passage with a warning to the U.S. to avoid jeopardizing peace and stability in the strategic waterway. It has also viewed U.S. overtures toward Taiwan with alarm, including its unveiling a new de facto embassy in Taiwan and passage of the Taiwan Travel Act, which encourages U.S. officials to visit the island. Military experts say the balance of power between Taiwan and China has shifted decisively in China's favor in recent years, and China could easily overwhelm the island unless U.S. forces came quickly to Taiwan's aid. China has also been alarmed... uh, I'm sorry, China has also alarmed Taiwan by ramping, ramping up military exercises this year, including flying bombers and other military aircraft around the island, and sending its aircraft carrier through the narrow Taiwan Strait, separating it from Taiwan. Well, hopefully uh, nothing ever happens with that, and I don't believe that it will, because what a nightmare for all parties concerned, including China, uh, if they uh, tried something there. We are out of time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for participating today. Uh, Thank you to Derek uh, Relaford for sending me that, that song. Uh, thank you to Fred for calling in. Thank you to Eric Agden for calling in. Thank you to all of you who listen to the show so faithfully. I appreciate you very much. And I will be back tomorrow uh, with uh, more Matt Connerton Unleashed in the Afternoon. We are live weekdays 4 to 6. And if you miss any part of today's show, it'll be up in just a little bit at WMNHradio.org. And that's it for me. I'm out of here for now. I'll talk at you all a little bit later. Bye, everybody. IPMNation.com